I've just been having a long and meaningful discussion with Anita about what time we're supposed to start. Anita tells me that the college runs on clock time, whereas the university always says that on time means five minutes late. So I can waffle for two more minutes, but I'm not going to. Uh, my name is David Caroli, and I have the uh, pleasure of being the chairperson for this talk. I was Anita's one of the supervisory team and officially the principal supervisor for Anita, but in fact, Anita's supervisors were several, and I'll go through them in a second. I know Anita's going to go through them as well. Uh, Anita is going to give her PhD completion seminar now, um, but I'm very happy to announce that her thesis has been examined and accepted by the examiners subject to minor revisions. <laughs> However, the university requires that she can't complete her thesis without a completion seminar. So what that means is that we have to go through this and now you can ask all the questions that you've wanted to ask Anita after she's given her talk around the seminar and the talk. Uh, Anita came to me at a workshop that I was running in Canberra now seven years ago, more or less. It was on geoengineering the climate system, or at the time it was called climate engineering. It was the first workshop that was run under the auspices of the Australian Academy of Science in Canberra. And Anita was working in the parliamentary library, trying to provide information and advice, I guess it was information really, to any parliamentarian who was interested in climate change and climate variability and other matters as well in the parliamentary library. But there was no uh, discussion in Australia really much at all about climate engineering or geoengineering. The workshop was aimed to do that, provide information to public space to get everyone that was working on climate change in one place and to talk about it. And after that workshop, or maybe during the workshop, Anita came up to me and said she'd like to do a PhD on that. Is that your recollection? Not quite. <laughs> Good. <laughs> That's why there's a completion seminar. Maybe I persuaded you that you should do a PhD on it. Anyhow, and it is finished, but before she finish, finishes, she's got to give this talk, which will give an overview of at least one of the many things that she covered in her PhD. A thesis is titled governing geoengineering sustainably. And the specific thing she's going to talk about is the scenario exercise that she undertook to help inform Australian geoengineering policy development, because there is zero Australian policy in detail on geoengineering. There's been discussion, there are some aspects of existing other legislation that's relevant to geoengineering, nothing specific. I'm going to hand over to Anita in just a second. I want to acknowledge that this talk and the Climate and Energy College is taking place here on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people in the Kulin Nation and want to pay my respects to the traditional owners and custodians of this land. Traditional owners were able to manage and survive their society through the transition from an ice age to a warm interglacial period, five degrees of warming. It's not clear that the current society is going to be able to manage that level of warming, but it may need to. Is that an appropriate introduction? Good luck. <laughs> Thanks, David. Uh, so I'd also like to echo um, David's acknowledgements to the traditional owners of the land. Um, and I think I can probably skip forward five slides because David's basically covered half of what I was going to talk to you about. Um,
the re requisite starting with technical malfunction. Okay. So I do want to start with some thank yous. A big thank you to David for being um, my supervisor, my primary supervisor. I had a panel, a committee of supervisors. John Wiseman is also here who was um, really supportive all the way through as well and his own research was quite um, inspirational to me. Um, two of my supervisors, it seems like, haven't been able to make it, um, but they were also a really big part of how I got to where I got to. Um, a massive thank you to my climate technology college family, the place where we are right now, the people that own this college are a unique, amazing, talented group of people and I've been so honoured to be part of this family and I'm really looking forward to seeing how they all go through their own journeys. Um, and a massive thank you to my actual real family and to this little bundle of joy that uh, had the good grace of A, giving me a deadline, she right, and B, waiting until I submitted my PhD. She came two weeks after. I submitted my PhD, which is why I haven't given this completion seminar yet, because at the time I was eight months pregnant. So I'm going to uh, talk to you today. You can't see the headings to my slides, but it says presentation outline. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to start off by telling you a little bit about geoengineering technologies. I imagine that everybody that's come here today already has some idea of what it is because it was in the title. Um, but I just want to make sure that we're all talking about the same thing. I'm going to talk to you about my actual motivation. I think my story differs a little bit from David's, but there are some, uh, some overlaps. I'm going to give you my aim and research questions because I don't want any of the academics in the audience to have conniptions because there aren't an aim or research question somewhere <laughs> in this presentation. But then I'm not going to follow a traditional um, method of academic presentation because it just doesn't make sense for my thesis. My thesis was a collection of five journal articles and so I'm going to go through those journal articles and I've chosen very briefly, I've chosen one to speak on in a little bit more depth because uh, the audience that we have today is a mix of social and physical scientists and I think it's the one that probably speaks most to that audience. Um, and there's no way I could talk about all my research in the 40 minutes or so that I have anyway. This is my final supervisor arriving. <laughs> um, so I'll tell you a little bit more about that as I come to it. I will put one little um, caveat here in the beginning. Whenever we talk about geoengineering, there are usually questions in the audience that turn into comments, that turn into long comments, that turn into very controversial views. And I don't really want to get into that debate here and now. So while I appreciate that everyone has very strong feelings about this topic, I may um, cut short some questions and move on to another one if I feel it's not particularly going to go in the direction that is useful in this context. So apologies in advance if that is yours and I do understand there are strong emotions about this topic um, but if you can just appreciate we only have limited time. What are geoengineering technologies? So if I can get from a show of hands who in this audience thinks that they could explain to someone else what geoengineering is? You don't need to be shy. <laughs> No tall poppy syndrome here. Okay, so a lot of you don't feel like you could do that. So I'm just gonna run you through at least how I tackled the, the concept of geoengineering, which as David mentioned is also referred to as climate engineering, climate media, climate, climate intervention, climate, there's so many different terms, mainly because people are trying to work, move away from the more controversial feelings associated with it. For me, climate engineering or geoengineering is trying to moderate climate change without having any effect on emissions. So you can look at concentrations and you look at heating, um, but not targeting emissions. So it's not emissions reduction. And generally we talk about two different categories at the moment of geoengineering, although there could be new ones that get proposed that are outside of those categories. And in fact, there already have been some proposed that don't fit strictly within those categories. One category is carbon dioxide removal. So the idea there is that we're not reducing emissions, but we're trying to reduce concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Um, the prominent, the leading technology, I guess, for the, I don't know how many of you are climate, very much in the climate space, when we talk about um, reducing atmospheric concentrations is that with the bathtub analogy, we're not trying to turn off the tap, we're just trying to use buckets to get water out of the bath or we're trying to make the plug hole bigger at the bottom to get that water out. The leading technologies in this space are um, ocean fertilization that's been around for the longest out of all the geoengineering technologies. Um, and the idea there is that there are sections of the ocean that are uh, nutrient in certain deficient, uh, deficient in certain nutrients, and by adding those nutrients, you promote the growth of biolo well, biological growth, phytoplankton and the like, which through photosynthesis absorbs carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. 
uh, artificial up welling does essentially the same thing. It brings nutrient-rich cold waters from the bottom of the ocean up to the surface, again, for the same effect. Um, Afforestation removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Direct air capture, so basically artificial trees that use various, process, various processes, uh, many of them chemical, to basically suck carbon dioxide out of the air, compress it, um, and store it either underground or on the seabed. There are others, but that's just a, a run through of what they're the main ones. The other category is solar radiation management, and there the idea is just to intercept solar radiation before it reaches the surface of the Earth. So just cool the Earth artificially. Leading technologies are stratospheric aerosols. So on this picture, it's with the aircraft, but it could be through sending balloons aloft or pipes pumped into the air where we're pumping basically little reflective particles that act like little mirrors and uh, reflect uh, solar radiation away from the Earth. That's probably the most, in, well, the most talked about technology at the moment, but cloud seeding is really growing in popularity in the academic literature. And there the idea is that the um, marine stratocumulus clouds, so to basically make the marine clouds whiter and brighter so that they're more reflective again of heat. Uh, space mirrors is another idea, and there are lots of them. But when I'm gonna talk about geoengineering throughout this talk and the way I did throughout my thesis was very much as just a, a bucket of technologies, a bunch of ideas, and a lot of them have different issues associated with them, but I didn't go into detail on any, any one of them. So why are we concerned about these geoengineering ideas? Sounds great, you know, it helps with climate change, climate change, bad thing, geoengineering must be a good thing. Well, the problem is that uh, there are lots of, um, it, it doesn't exist yet, and we, it's highly complex, it's highly uncertain, we don't really know how to manage this beast that we've never really had to manage before. Some of the concerns include, and this is not all of them, these are just the headline ones, is that, for example, stratospheric aerosols or any that um, affect global uh, global temperatures are likely to have regionally diverse impacts. So uh, they could potentially move the African or Asian monsoons, they could... Um, have effects on regional areas that are different from the global average, since we know that nowhere actually is the average, it's the average. So the problem there is who decides when, where, what, and how much of this global thermostat, which technologies do we use? When do we, when do we start using it? When do we stop? Whose rules? For some people, climate change, for some parts of the world, climate change might be a good thing. So therefore, do they get a decision in this? Uh, one of the issues is that if we do things like cooling the earth or even sucking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, it's likely to lessen the incentive to reduce emissions. We've got another, we've got another solution, so it's less of a priority. Um, and if that is the case, then the concern is that things like stratospheric aerosols don't actually alleviate ocean acidification in any way. And therefore, where this problem continues under some, as basically a protective umbrella. Uh, we've got no way to fully test geoengineering without actually deploying. You can do as much research as you want on computer models and in labs at the end of the day. Once you try it in this highly complex earth system, which is highly interconnected, you're not really, you don't really know what's going to happen until you do it. And then the difficulty of attribution. We all, already have a lot of trouble attributing this flood or that bushfire to climate change versus natural variability. What if we then introduce yet another forcer, which is um, a, uh, basically a machine? If uh, solar radiation management were to be terminated early, if you think about it, you've got this big umbrella protecting you, you continue to increase carbon dioxide levels. If you, for whatever reason, need to terminate that solar radiation management, temperatures go up at a much higher rate than they would have done previously. And this is a problem because SRM could technically, a lot of the scholars say, be deployed unilaterally. So one country like China or Russia could do it or a, a grouping and alliance of small island states could decide to do it or even one rich Bill Gates or Richard Branson could go ahead and do it. One of the concerns that's specifically about carbon dioxide removal is that it increases the competition for land, which is already a problem in the food for fuel debate. So this is just a list of some of the issues, governance issues with geoengineering. Um, to give you a taste of, of the fact that this is a, a big problem that um, we really need to think carefully about. So my research, I want to tell you a little bit here about how I came to look at this topic and why I looked at what I'm looking at. Yes, it was seven years ago. I was actually doing a master's at the ANU and as part of that, and as part of my work with the Parliamentary Library, I went to the climate change talks uh, negotiations in Copenhagen. We've all forgotten how much of a big deal they were because Paris happened in 2015, but in 2009, it was a big deal. Um, 
it was a massive conference and it happened to be the conference where the UK Royal Society, which is essentially the UK's version of our Academy of Sciences, published this report called Geoengineering the Climate. And this was the first, uh, I guess, uh, it was a milestone because it was the first report that was in that sort of um, lay audience readership. It wasn't a t it wasn't an academic paper. It was very easy to digest, and it was launched at this conference. And I went to the launch, and there were a number of um, really eminent professors and really well spoken and very educated and um, intelligent physicists and uh, chemists and social scientists all speaking about this report that they were glorifying and as you walked out of this these side events where these were being talked about and there were several side events there were NGOs standing at the door handing out flyers about why geoengineering is such a bad thing at the same time as the Copenhagen conference was going on, there was a parallel conference called Klima Forum happening a little bit down, well, a couple of blocks down the way, which was an NGO event. And they were hosting their own events on climate engineering. And for example, this is one of their reports from the ETC group called Geopiracy. So they were trying to highlight all the dangers of geoengineering and why we really should be thinking about this um, more uh, extensively. When I got home, I started looking into geoengineering and realized that the UK and the US uh, House committees, so the Congressional, well, the House of Reps Committee in the US and the UK Science and Technology Committee had collaborated on a joint inquiry onto the regulation of geoengineering. I don't think that had ever happened before. And they published this lengthy report. All this is happening. There's lots happening in the UK, lots happening in uh, the US talking about geoengineering. I found out later there was a lot happening in Germany. There were the three sort of centers where people were talking about geoengineering and no one in Australia was talking about. I worked at Parliament, I spoke, spoke to a lot of the very influential people in our Parliament and no one even knew what geoengineering was. I spoke to a lot of people at the conference and a lot of NGOs, delegates, they didn't actually know what geoengineering was. They thought I was saying geo-sequestration, which is a different thing. So it occurred to me that we probably need to be thinking about it in Australia where we have a very different uh, set of um, climate uh, influences than the Northern Hemisphere. We have some different, well, not different influences, but we have a different situation, different context. And we also have a different um, set of uh, levers to play with in terms of um, we're in the Southern Ocean, which is quite a clean ocean. We have quite a clean atmosphere. There are things we could be doing here in geoengineering that um, others in the Northern Hemisphere would have more trouble doing. So what I wanted to do was start looking at um, what would sustainable geoengineering policy look like in Australia? When I say sustainable geoengineering, I mean, um, or when I say sustainable policy, I mean policy for sustainability. So my research question was this whole top bit, but I've greyed out that first section of my research question because, as I think is the case with many theses or many PhD research topics, my topic didn't really evolve until I got halfway through and realised what was really important and what I needed to look at in this research. So what I wanted to look at was geoengineering policy in Australia, but as it developed, I realized that what was really important to look at was this situation of scenarios. We're talking about the future. We're talking about something that doesn't exist yet. And our biggest, strongest tool for that is to look at scenarios. And therefore, I focused in on, on the case of geoengineering scenarios. So, but to do that, you need to sort of go backwards before you go forward. So making sense of the future depends to a considerable degree on making sense of the past. And that's where I started. So for the academics out there, these are my research questions. And essentially, the first one corresponds to the first paper I published. This is the second paper. This is the third one. This is the last two. Um, I'll be going through them as I go through the talk anyway, so you don't need to focus on them. So as I said, I, um, I published, a, well, I, uh, my thesis consisted of, of a collection of five papers. The ones in purple were published at the time and the ones in green under review. And the one I'm going to talk about the most is that middle one, because as I said, it um, is most relevant to the audience that we have today. But I will start at the beginning to tell you how we got there. So before I could think about the future of geoengineering and how we could design sustainable policy, I needed to turn around and look at, well, what geoengineering governance already exists? As David pointed out, there's nothing in Australia. So if we wanted to start creating geoengineering policy in Australia, we need to look at what envelope we're sitting in. What's outside? What's the global situation in terms of geoengineering policy? So this paper was basically trawling through all the international treaties and seeing where there was relevance to geoengineering, either where it had been mentioned or where there was things that overlapped with geoengineering. So obviously a climate change, climate change document, so the UNFCCC, is relevant to geoengineering governments. Um, but there are others, the Convention on Biological Diversity, et cetera. Um, 
as well as looking at these treaties, I also looked at what were the main, I guess, policy documents being put out there, mainly because I wanted to see who were the main actors in this space, who were the people that were having a real influence in how we talked about and how we thought about geoengineering. And so I put this, position this within an earth system governance perspective and the earth system governance perspective says it's not just about laws, it's about all sorts of other things such as actors. And what I found from this review is that the situation we're currently within is what I've called geoengineering governance by default. So there's not any purposeful governance in there on geoengineering, but there's a lot of other things happening around the sides that in, impact on how we think about it and how it is being governed. So it's happening by default. And the, the actors that are most important in this space are the academic communities because they're the ones that are most informed and they're doing the research and they're talking about it the most, what they say have a lot, has a lot of influence, basically because they're talking in a void. What I found in this is that governments on the national level, governments are adopting a real wait and see perspective. Let's just, let's just see what comes out. Let's see what the scientists say about it. Let's see how people react to it. What's the public perception? And then once we know how it's heading, then we'll step in and think about how we should be regulating and take it to the intergovernmental level um, where the international treaties are, are discussed and negotiated. So from this, I said, well, okay, if there is a void happening at the moment, but the academic communities are the most influential, let's start focusing on what they think. What, are they, what do they think is the best way to govern this space? And what tools are they using? So the first thing I did was to look at what, all, what the academic community is saying about how we should govern geoengineering. What governance proposals are out there and what do they tell us? What I found by looking through all of the governance proposals in both the academic and grey literature, although it was a grey literature, it was the same authors that were writing for the academic literature. There's a consensus across these papers generally that there's a need for legit legitimacy and inclusiveness in, in geoengineering policy. So we really need to get as many people as possible involved and we need to have legitimacy. So we need to follow due process, for example. Um, there's also generally an agreement that at some stage in this in this discussion, we're going to need treaty-based regulation. But where there was a divergence in the literature is that there's a group, there's a group of scholars that think, well, we shouldn't really create treaties now because we don't really understand this beast that we're dealing with yet. So let's just hold off and let's make sure that our treaties are based on the science that we are now going to develop. And there's another school of thought that says, well, actually, no, we can't go ahead doing research without that governance. So we should be now thinking about what treaties we need so that we can steer that science in the direction that we're all comfortable with. And then I found that actually you could categorise these proposals out there by what governance priorities there were. So the, great, the um, global environmental governance researchers look at geoengineering as a harm minimisation problem. This is the way that they look at most environmental issues. And they said, and they tend to think that in which we're trying to minimise harm from geoengineering, then what we really need is another treaty, or either another treaty or we need to, a protocol to UNFCCC or we need to somehow fit it into all the treaties that we already have. And then there's another group of scientists that I'm calling the technologists that are more concerned, they, yes, they worry about the harm of geoengineering or the potential damage, but what they worry about more is that over-regulation will stymie research. And so they're more focused on this freedom of research concept and supporting and protecting this knowledge creation so that it happens in a way that is uh, most efficient and is driven by the science. What I did find is that none of the challenges of geoengineering and none of the ones that I listed at the beginning um, or any that, lo that list was not in, uh, in exclusive, but none of these challenges is actually a new challenge. It's not something we haven't faced before. Usually it's something we've already faced when thinking about climate change or it's something we've faced when thinking about uh, nuclear disarmament or artificial intelligence. There are overlaps there. What is different is the way they all sit together. Um, so the way all of these problems and, and challenges interact and what was lacking in this in this literature is an emphasis on the unique so it's always like well we know how to deal with this let's take this way of dealing with it. we traditionally do it this way so let's adopt that we usually use this policy but really there's no well actually this is a new problem let's think about it in a new way and let's let's think about unique outcomes um, the other part of so the other part of seeing that academic communities have a key role in setting this agenda is to think, well, how, are, how do they envisage geoengineering? So we know how they think it should be governed, but how do they actually think about it? What, what does geoengineering mean to them in the future? And that's where this paper came from. So 
most of the scientific literature, well not most, but a lot of the scientific literature in geoengineering uses scenarios. They use about, they use um, depictions of the future to think about what sort of problems might arise and how we might deal with them. So this is a paper called How Geoengineering Scenarios Frame Assumptions and Create Expectations. It was published in Sustainability Science uh, last year. And in this paper, what I did was uh, a meta-analysis of all the use of geoengineering scenarios to see what sort of um, visions they created about how geoengineering could be used and where we're headed with it. So before I go into this, I want to make sure that we're all talking about the same thing when we talk about scenarios, because it's a very, it's a, it's a vague word. So scenarios are essentially stories of how the future could evolve. They could be anything. Before you step out your front door, you think, well, what's the weather going to be today? Is it going to rain? Is it going to be windy? Is it not? Should I take, is there going to be traffic? Should I take the car? Should I take the tram? These are all scenarios of how the day could evolve, and then you make your decisions around that. But that's not only the type of scenarios we have. There are very different types of scenarios in there, and they fill different roles. But we know that scenarios have been central to climate change research. All through the IPCC reports, we use scenarios and we evolve these scenarios over the decades to make sure that they reflect the way we want to think about climate change. And therefore, obviously, they're central to geoengineering scholarship as well. And I like this quote from McDowell and Eames. They were doing a study of hydrogen and they said they were looking at more than just scenarios, but they argued that scenarios can play an important role in the development and propagation of shared visions of the future, creating powerful expectations of the economic, social and environmental potential of um, emerging technologies and mobilizing the intellectual, financial, political and institutional resources necessary for their realization. So I guess the key words here are shared visions, um, expectations, and mobilizing. So if you think about, um, if you create a scenario where geoengineering um, solves all our environmental problems, you're mobilizing the, you're mobilizing people to, to look into that scenario and, and investigate that scenario. You're setting up CRCs into that idea of the future or these shared visions. You're putting in subjects in master's degree so people are already thinking about it in that way. So you're sort of mobilizing and steering it towards that existing way of thinking about it. You're talking to politicians in such a way that, well, geoengineering is one of the potential ways we could look at this and geoengineering would do this. So already in their mind, that's the direction we're heading. And there's a small but growing literature um, on the use of geoengineering scenarios in this space specifically. So Sean Lowe in 2017 um, published a paper where he argued that geoengineering scenarios actually anchor the expectations and motivate that actors. So you're motivated to look at this certain way of tackling the problem because everyone else is doing it in that way as well. And there's this normalization. Uh, and Tilo Witz did a sort of a, a very, he, he spoke to a bunch of climate modelers in the geoengineering space and he looked at a lot of the models and the scenarios and he argued that as well as being used to promote scientific understanding of geoengineering and the climate system, they also used as little platforms to invent, to play, they're this sort of playpen or your sandpit to play around with geoengineering technologies and see what they can and can't do. And it's, I, I guess I want to, put in the disclaimer at the front here, none of what I'm going to say in this paper or in this analysis is a criticism of the way we use scenarios and models. It's just something that I think we should be aware of, that we need to think about while we're doing it. Um, so the physical scientists, and there's a few of the climate modelers here, don't, none of this is an attack. It's to say, let's think about what the effects is of the way we use these scenarios. So what I wanted to look at in this paper was how are scenarios used in the geoengineering research? What are the key characteristics of these scenarios? Are there um, themes emerging? Are there commonalities? Are there big divergences? Um, and therefore, what are assumptions and expectations to create and what are the implications for governance? At the time, so I wrote this paper, I probably wrote it, it took a year to publish, so I probably wrote it in 2016. There were 102 papers using um, geoengineering scenarios. Uh, the bulk of those were from the physical sciences, so climate modelling. Um, almost all of them were global scenarios. No one was looking at the regional. Uh, and some of these were probably not that interesting until we get into the actual analysis, but I can come back to it. Once I got into the research, I, read, I guess I should also state that I did the search for the term geoengineering and climate engineering and didn't use the specific technologies. That was for a reason, because we're talking about shared visions and we're talking about setting up expectations and um, about these scenarios unifying people around one common concept. 
I want those people who have chosen to associate with those concepts to be the target of my analysis. So it was the scientists who were specifically using the term geoengineering because they wanted us to think about geoengineering in this way. I also used the term scenarios in my search and I didn't use pathways and visions and all the rest of it because when I did the search I realized that anyone that was actually using the scenario centrally might use pathways, visions, etc. but they would somewhere in the paper also use the term scenario. One set of papers that is excluded from this just didn't get picked up from that search because of the different terminology are the very sort of economic game theoretic papers. So they would be interesting to include as well. There were only about three or four at this stage anyway. I just thought I should mention it. Um, so I realized when I got into it, you couldn't actually compare many of these papers. So it was like comparing apples and oranges and you weren't getting much information out of that. So what was interesting was to categorize them, to compare, to look at them within these categories and then to look at step back and look at the, cate the categories as themselves, as groups. One self-evident category was these science papers. So the, the scenarios uses input for climate models, not always climate models, but models in general. And I called this um, scenarios for scientific knowledge building. So they're a tool for building knowledge in that space. Then there were 31 papers that didn't fit that classification. They were either social or mixed science papers. And there were two types within that. The bulk of them I've called strategic conversations. So that's where scenarios were used very simply to frame an argument. So as a way, as a, as a rhetoric tool, as a narrative tool to pull out points that they wanted to make. So um, if you might say, you should grab an umbrella because it might rain, you're putting forward the scenario of rain purely because you want to make the argument that you should take an umbrella. So there wasn't much thought put into the scenarios beyond the point that you wanted to make or the argument that you wanted to draw out. So if you're talking about governance, you know, this could occur and therefore we could govern in this way. But justifying that this could occur is not the focus. The other 10 papers, scenarios, were the actual focus of the paper. So we used it as exploratory tools. So it's where a specially curated workshop was held in such a way to talk about geoengineering and look at how the future could evolve and how geoengineering could be a part of that and use that to explore the implications of geoengineering. So very different ways of using scenarios. So what did I find? In the science papers, if I gloss over some terms that people don't know, just jump in now rather than waiting to the end so then we understand it afterwards. So most of the um, scenarios in this space were from what's called the GeoMIP, the Geoengineering Model Into Comparison Project. So into comparison projects are when, um, so models run, run lots of different, models are, uh, the science behind or the maths behind models are all different. Um, and if you want to be able to uh, compare or to look at um, get an understanding of your range of uncertainty, you need to, all of these models to run the same settings. And so that's what an intercomparison project does, is let's all run our models in the same way and then when we get to the end, we'll be able to have a look at what's our level of uncertainty, et cetera. So the, there's a set of GeoMIP scenarios specific, specifically for this. And they focus on, the first set focus on stratospheric aerosols. Um, and they're based mostly on what's called RCP 4.5, which depending on who you are, you would or would not argue that it's the middle of the range climate scenario going forward. All of these scenarios focus on average temperatures and average precipitation. There's not much of a focus on say maximum temperatures or diurnal ranges or um, extreme weather events, for example. Because it's necessary to do so, they assume ideal conditions. They can't, for example, well, they don't generally just have a volcanic eruption happen halfway through your, series, your um, time period. They also assume technological perfection. So they assume that you'll turn on geoengineering and it'll work the way you expect and you won't need to moderate that to get what you were expecting. Um, whereas in, in practice, there would probably be a stage of learning by doing. So we would do something, we'd see what the outcome was, and then we'd ramp up or down. It's not included in the models. And they also don't include... Um, change behavior that might occur from geoengineering. So once we do it, how will people behave or politicians or businesses behave differently now that we have that geoengineering and therefore how will that change the environmental context within, geo within which geoengineering is occurring? The second category where it was more these strategic conversations were all again global. They focused to 2100 and beyond. These ones are 2100 mainly. Uh, again, they focus mainly on stratospheric aerosols. And the assumptions that they made was Again, that the technology is completely controllable. So we know what we're doing, we turn it on and it happens the way we expect. 
And then there was a heavy, fo heavy focus on two types of scenarios. One of them here I've called the emergency scenario, but it can be called the plan B scenario or last resort scenario. And there the idea is, well, yes, we don't need geoengineering now. We can still got time. Uh, but we should definitely develop the technology, put some, lots of money into the research so that if we need it in 15 years' time, we can press the button. The unilateral action scenario, as I described before, was this idea that um, anyone could do it without getting consent from other nations. So really, it's cheap enough and feasible enough. Um, another paper came out this month saying that for stratospheric aerosols, we probably need about 4,000 aircrafts a year, ramping up by 4,000 each year beyond that for 15 years, um, which is not actually a huge amount if you're uh, Bill Gates, for example. Um, and then the last group was uh, using scenarios themselves to draw out some of the implications of some of the issues with climate engineering. These ones tended to have a shorter time frame, so 10 to 20 years, and that's because it's quite difficult to get together and think about 100 years ahead. It's not something that we can usually do. So we think about it in more, um, uh, more within the time span of our decision making. There were participatory pro processes, they were mainly qualitative, so we're here we're talking about numbers and graphs, there we're talking about narratives and stories, and they drew out four defining variables. So when you talk, when there are several ways of doing scenario workshops and exercises, but a common way, for example, is to, to look at the, um, to look at a binary situation to say, well, um, to, uh, it could, there, this is a determinant that could go this way or that way, so let's look at both circum, both possible outcomes. Um, but here's another variable that could go this way or that way. So if we put these together, then we end up with four different possible outcomes. And so there's our four scenarios. So the defining variables that were common across a lot of them, that um, were at least more than half of them, that came out was the idea of controllability. So there was, yes, it could be controllable geoengineering, or it could not be. It could be something that we can't control. Uh, in one, on one side, there could be universal agreement on geoengineering, or there could not be. And that ends with very different outcomes. The other two, last two were one, the perception of geoengineering, geoengineering technology. So there could be, could be um, public support for it and public acceptance, or there could not be. Um, and severity of climate impacts, there could be quite severe climate impacts uh, in the future, or there could be less severe. And this obviously plays into the perception of geoengineering technology. So these sort of four defining variables were drawn out from these processes. And so, what sort of expectations come from, from these findings? And I actually haven't listed them all here because it's just too much. Um, from the physical sciences, to reduce uncertainty, there's this traditional custom or the scientific process is to idealize standardized model settings and converge assumptions around a very limited range of values. You need to do this to progress the science. But what expectations does this create? We also assume in that area is that geoengineering will be used to maintain the status quo. So we always talk about geoengineering either bringing us back to pre-industrial levels or bringing us to some status quo. There's no talk about was it actually what we want to use it for. And all of this research tends to answer the question, what if we engineer, rather than how should we engineer? And so I argue here that these these um, papers or these scenarios create an image of geoengineering as this silver bullet technology that's available as this non-disruptive off-the-shelf product. When you need it, you take it and you use it. Um, in the second category, um, there's discussion of the idea of, say, a geoengineering ban, and pretty much across the board, it's, it's refuted as not a sustainable option. If you're gonna have a ban on geoengineering, there's gonna be some sunset clause on it somewhere. Um, and there's always this treatment of geoengineering as though um, it's an imp and it's, so this, this last resort of this emergency scenario is always geoengineering seen as this insurance policy that we use at short notice. So again, like with the first category, we're saying it's not something that's gradual that we'll think about now. It's, it's a problem that um, we'll be able to switch on when we need it later. Sorry, a solution will be able to switch on later when we need it. So this closes down options. Um, by narrowing, you know, the range of plausible routes, the way we could use or think about geoengineering. And then as the point I already made before is that the exploratory set scenarios were informative in that they drew out these sort of four key areas that people tend to be thinking about geoengineering in the, at the moment as being key issues. So what's the implication of this for research? Well, the first one is that, um, a silver bullet approach ignores the fact that we live in this interconnected nation society and that there are actually lots of different ways to think about this problem and that it could have lots of different um, outcomes that we maybe have got blinkers onto because we've idealised and standardised the way we look at it. 
The last resort scenario, which also happens with this silver, ball, silver bullet approach, is that um, we're looking at geoengineering as though it's some, uh, some option that will be decided later by others and resolved in this very top-down manner rather than thinking about it as, well, this is something that we should be talking about now. How do we actually want to use geoengineering? What would be its purpose? How would it be integrated in our existing climate policy um, framework, etc.? Um, generally, across all of these ones, interdisciplinarity is lacking. So if you're, a, if you're a modeler, you're going in and you're looking at it with a modeler's perspective and you're using scientific methods. If you're a lawyer, you're using scenarios to draw out key legal is issues. Um, if you're uh, a geographer, you're looking at it from that perspective. Whereas what the other four scenarios drew, the other scenarios drew out, these ones here, which, were, which generally employed interdisciplinary methods. So they got a group of experts together that think about things in lots of different ways. The issues that they drew out, sorry, these ones are lacking from the, all the other scenarios. They're not included in there. And so I argue that maybe we need another class of geoengineering scenarios, a fourth one, where we merge these two. So we start thinking about, um, how the use of scenarios impacts on how we might eventually use scenarios. And so, um, for example, these scenarios here, the GeoMIP ones, when, we, when you read these papers where they've used the GeoMIP scenarios, they never tell you why they use scenario G1 or G3 or G4 in this research. They just use it because they're contributing to the science. And the more research you have on, say, scenario G3, the better we'll understand the impacts of scenario G3. But there's no one sentence or two sentences at the top that says, we've used scenario G3 because we believe that is most realistically reflects what might occur in this situation. So there's no sort of engagement with what are the larger implications of my research beyond just those results? Um, so the final conclusions of that analysis was that yes, scenarios are fundamental and to, to the to geoengineering research. Um, and they give us a lot of insight into not just the science, but also how we're tracking. But that this image of geoengineering as a quick, quick fix rather than a reflection of basically how society is changing and, and where we want to head is missing. Um, we see ge a geoengineering future as a product of failed climate action rather than an opportunity to explore what is possible or desirable through technology. Not that I'm saying we should or should not go that way, it's just a conversation that we should be having. And as Tilo um, argued, computer models are platforms of forming and conveying expectations technologies, but they don't invite this broad range of societal interest and views, and therefore they're delivering quite a narrow view um, of these expectations. So I completely run out of time. Um, but where I went from here in my research was that, okay, given these conclusions about scenarios, what are the types of scenarios that we should be building? Um, and given the other point from that research is there was nothing in the Australian space. All of it is Europe or North America, Canada and the US, Germany especially. There's nothing around Australia. So I, my way to deal with this was to run a scenario exercise in Australia um, to start this conversation in Australia amongst, and it was a broad range of um, academics, business people, um, uh, policy makers, um, representatives from all different disciplines as a way to start this conversation on geoengineering and to look at um, what, what sort of options are there and how, how do we look at this in the, in, in the, within the perspective of sustainable, sustainability policy. What I found through the four scenarios that emerged from that workshop, which was held in 2016, um, is that depending on how, to geoengineering, depending on how you looked at it and how it evolved and developed and was deployed, could actually be framed as either a form of climate mitigation, climate adaptation, or climate optimization. And in Australia, what we actually have at the moment, because um, for those of you that are a little bit interested in the space, we have a number of projects emerging in Australia that do fit the geoengineering classification or the definition. It's emerging very much as a form of climate adaptation at the moment. Where I went with these scenarios is that I then use them to stress test, what I call stress testing, um, policy proposals in Australia, climate policy proposals at the federal level, not the state level. Um, and they're not groundbreaking findings, but basically uh, the recommendations from that were that looking at these four scenarios and looking at um, how Australia is tracking, we really should be looking at decarbonising. Um, preparing for the worst impacts of climate change beyond what we think they might be. And we should be starting this inclusive and technologically and ideologically neutral conversation about geoengineering. 
and we should be financing research that is interdisciplinary, transparent and inclusive looking at both the implications of geoengineering Australia, but also the capacity for, and we should be engaging in the international discussions that are already happening. I haven't got any on this because I knew I just wouldn't have time to go into it, but it can be the subject of another seminar. So the conclusions of the thesis were, I aimed to progress understanding on whether and how scenarios might be used to inform sustainable geoengineering policy in Australia. I highlighted the fact that there's a lack of the sustainability agenda within um, the geoengineering governance uh, focus um, and in the scholarship, that scenarios are a good way to incorporate these things, um, but that Australia's current approach to climate policy has been dogmatic and short-sighted and the use of geoengineering scenarios could actually break that tradition. Um, and so I suggest that climate policy needs to be broadened to include at least a debate on geoengineering. That's it. Thank you. You covered a lot of space. I did, and I needed one paper. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? I am sure there will be at least a few. Questions for Anita? Awesome. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah. I'll grab that. Uh, I'm Stephen. I'm a PhD student at the college. Um, Anita, I want to ask, there's a lot of uh, models, including like in the IPCC special report, on, on keeping global warming below one and a half degrees that rely, or at least that kind of uh, frame meeting those targets in terms of an overshoot and then a net negative emissions sort of scenario um, where emissions might, um, like we might go beyond that sort of temperature target and then um, we'll have to kind of soak up a lot of emissions through negative emissions technologies. Does that sort of thing fit into your, like, um, framing of geoengineering is that a geoengineering scenario as you see it or is that something else yeah so that's a really good question Stephen, and that that would be part of a, a bigger analysis when i highlighted what search terms i use specifically for my research and that i use the word geoengineering and climate engineering as the main search terms what that excluded was anyone that deliberately didn't want to be associated with this discussion and that tends to be this big group um, of um, both policymakers and scientists that are looking specifically at negative emissions in the land sector who really don't want to be associated with that geoengineering discussion because of the tensions that arise when you start talking about. So they are largely excluded from that analysis by their choice, but absolutely it would be great to expand that research and to look at it from that perspective as well. And I, I think that was a, probably a failing of that paper. Yes, and no, because a lot of the discussions on negative emission technologies happen after you'd already framed all well, your questions. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's carbon dioxide removal. Yeah. Well, there's carbon dioxide removal that was included in there, which are things like direct air capture and ocean fertilization. But specifically like BEX and afforestation were largely, they like to not associate themselves with the term geoengineering. Other questions? Everyone's stunned into silence. I'm not a scientist and don't have any expertise around these areas. When you talked about the assumptions that the scientific community was making around geoengineering, that they weren't looking at it in a multifactorial space and they were seeing, assuming that um, system or an approach that they were developing would work and that there wouldn't be complications, that staggers me that you say that. I would have thought that, that the the entire scientific community in the last however many decades because of the, the focus on complex systems would have got past that. Can, can you just comment on that? So it's a good question, excellent question. So we're not um, at the stage in geoengineering yet to be answering, so it's, it's all quite, it's quite nation. So we're really at the beginning of understanding and this is where I say, we're looking at what if we do in geoengineer, not how. So we're still trying to understand the science. So it's what if we, um, you, what if we reduce the solar constant to this to by this amount? What effect does that have on all these other or on all these other factors, climate system, earth systems, depending on what the research is? Um, and then how can we learn from that? It's not at the stage of well, um, what if uh, it it doesn't work, or what if um, we have a war in the middle and and this happens, or what if um, you know these eventualities are not included? Is that what you're asking me? They're not included in there. The vast vast majority. Of I think you looked at one, I think 71. Yeah. I think that you said in that, that chart, 
yeah, in that chart there, I, I think your summary comments of that was like assume ideal conditions. I mean, are these are these sort of? I'm not a scientist. So I say are these scientific norms. Is this a, a, a tested methodology that you would do, or is that something that's a lack? Absolutely. If you think about how complex the system is, you have to hold all other things constant, play with this, and see what happens. If you're changing everything at the same time, so non-ideal conditions. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. We do have an audience on the internet engaging in this talk via the web. We've got a question from someone. Yeah, so we have a question from Robert McLean, who's online. Uh, the question is, hasn't humanity been experimenting with geoengineering for decades in a host of subtle ways? Um, so yeah, I'll take that one as a comment, but yes, we have. And you could argue that climate change itself is geoengineering. Yeah. Can we get a question from a woman? <laughs> oh, I do. Good point. Ellie. <laughs> Hi. Um, great talk. Linda. Um, I was just wondering, actually, if you could talk a little bit about the actual scenarios that you ran and the audience and just sort of talk a little bit more about your experience of running scenario workshops and how you found that and sort of the outcomes of, of that experience. Um, yeah, I won't go into a huge amount of detail because there's a lot there. But um, so basically what this workshop was is 20 different um, people, f experts in their own right in different areas. Um, and it was a full day workshop, but we sat down and first we did a, a Q and A session so that everybody knew what we were talking about when we talked about geoengineering. But um, David gave some information on it and I gave some information, but we tried not to bias views around geoengineering. So we made it more of a discussion between them and just corrected them when it was scientifically inaccurate. And then um, we went through sort of a, I merged two existing processes of um, scenario, uh, ways to develop scenarios simply because, and this is always interesting, I found as we got halfway through the day that rather than focusing in and reducing the number of variables that we could be talking about in the future, as they were getting more into it and understanding it more, they were actually expanding, expanding, expanding. So I needed another tool to reduce that down. So I merged two different techniques. Um, and I guess, and, and resulted in four scenarios. One of them was called corporatocracy. So it started out as two scenarios that they ended up turning into one, which is where the um, corporate world rules and geoengineering is um, rolled out because basically it's the cheapest way to meet the Paris Agreement and it makes sense. And maybe the only other thing that I would add to it was that the participants, the 20 people, were from a very broad disciplinary backgrounds, uh, age backgrounds, uh, gender. Two genders represented. Only two. Okay. <laughs> No. Uh, Did you find them falling along disciplinary lines? So no, we mixed them. We socially sort of engineered the group so that they were um, were mixed. And um, so there was this corporate oxy group uh, scenario. There was one that was they called. Um, God, I can't even remember them now. Spaceship Earth, Spaceship Earth which was very much um, this world where we uh, we sort of have have come have, have come to terms with the complexity and it's time to use it in such a way that we can actually optimize our climate. Um, there was anyway, there were these four scenarios that came out of it, and I guess what I found most interesting was that we actually spent probably the whole day getting everyone used to the idea of what we mean when we talk about scenarios and how you build the scenarios and what's the benefit of scenarios. And it wasn't until, and then after the scenarios, there was probably a four week process of communication between us as we, um, as we honed the scenarios and the narratives to something that everybody sort of agreed with. Um, and it wasn't until we sort of got down the track that they started understanding why we were all there and what we were doing. And I think that's the, um, it, it I guess that's evidence of the, the lack of this idea of future thinking that we, you know, these were all experts. They were real leaders in their fields, whether it was business or policy or whatever. And they, they weren't think they couldn't think in that future space the way we really need them to. And then it was subsequently. So even eight months, nine months down the track that I'm getting emails back from them saying, I was thinking about your scenario and you know, this is really quite amazing. And I was using this and, and a couple of them were lecturers who started using scenarios in their lecturing. So for me, the big take home was that, we're not good at this. We're not good at thinking about the future and in a systematic way. And in an interdisciplinary way and as well. And an interdisciplinary yeah. way. So we should move on. I know. Um, David Spratt, I'm an interested punter. Um, the case for geoengineering will become more urgent over time, I mean, two, three, four decades. I mean, this will really hit us. In that period of time, the um, 
national security implications of climate change means that states at least will probably disappear in the international order, may no longer be fit for purpose. Are we making assumptions about the capacity of the international order to negotiate treaties and get to resolve these issues when in fact you could order, you could, I would, for example, argue that even UNFCCC um, may, long, may no longer be fit for purpose. Do we have a governance problem at that level? Right, thanks, David. So here, basically, this is one of the key, in the 10 exploratory scenarios at workshops that I looked at, universal agreement on geoengineering or even the capacity to have universal anything is one of the, the variables. So there's a lot of the scenarios are well, actually there's, there's a world where we are just fragmented and we can't agree. Um, and that doesn't come out in any of these. It comes out in these ones where we're actually focused on thinking about what are the variables we should be thinking about. And it came out in our scenarios as well on the day is that there were um, at least two of the four from memory where there, there's just, there's not global agreement, but where there is in every case, it was under a UN um, sort of umbrella. So the idea that we wouldn't be getting away from that in the, between now and 2050, which is when my scenarios were targeting. So, supplementary question. Anita, congratulations on your PhD. Thank you. uh, is someone leading, can you refer us to, to leaders of thinking in that scenario? Who is, who is really doing the hard thinking globally about political models? Uh, so, the gov so governance models. Exactly following on from the question, so is there who, someone... who are publishing these papers? Yeah, who's, who's writing about and proposing governance models that could be successful? In, you know, is so there anyone doing this work? In the mainly world? academics, mainly in the legal and political sciences spheres, mainly from the big ones are Harvard and Oxford. Oh. Um, and I think they're the main ones. There's a couple of think tanks that are... So there's a Canadian think tank that's looking at space. UTAS is setting up a bit of a group to think about it here in Australia. Definitely. Yeah. Um, but mainly scholars. So we're not really talking at any level other than academics talking to each other, but quite influential academics. So the Harvard group, influential people that, you know, have thought about a lot of these things and have got the ears of a lot of important people. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Congratulations, Anita. That Thanks, was, it's a really impressive um, body of work um, and so important. I wonder whether you can comment on the, the context in a science policy interface, because uh, where my mind goes immediately listening to your research is the, the risk of perpetuating the idea that science, both physical and social science, kind of independently exists to inform some, you know, other policy making world. And I wonder about the ethics, you know, what's the role of ethics here um, and ethicists in thinking about scientists and researchers <coughs> talking into being these kinds of these kinds of knowledges and futures, and um, I guess the corollary or the second part of that question is: What's the comparable science policy conundrum? Whether it's cloning, whether it's perhaps nuclear has gone a bit past it. What's the corollary or what's the what's the other kind of example issues where ethics, the ethics of doing research, are fundamental to talking into being these kind of possible futures. Does that make sense as a question? Yeah, yeah. So there's a, there's a really strong um, body of literature around the ethics of geoengineering and maybe four or five really strong thinkers in this space. Um, and they also use scenarios in ways of thinking about, well, you know, if we went this direction, what are the ethics of that? And if we went this way, what is that? And so to that, in, I get, and, and that, so it's a good question because it is a big part of this, this debate. In terms of relevant comparison, it depends on which, which parts of that, uh, because a lot of the emerging technologies, so artificial intelligence and cloning and GMOs and things like that, um, are, are comparable in terms of some of the issues that arise when we talk about the ethics of it is that, well, if we're talking about it, then we're already sort of making it happen. But there's nothing that compares to one of the... One of the um, governance challenges that I haven't listed here is known as the moral hazard. And the idea there is that once, which is basically lessening the incentive to decarbonise, is once we start talking about it, we've sort of um, already legitimised it and normalised it and therefore, you know, we, we, there's no way to avoid it. You can't, we don't generally buy something like buy geoengineering research so that we can then just put it on the shelf and not use it. 
generally if we're researching we're probably going to use it which is where the artificial intelligence and the cloning and all that sort of comes along there are examples of where we have done that. So nuclear disarmament, for example, is an exam is where we've gone, well, we've got the technology, we've developed it, but we've all agreed no one's going to touch it, right? Um, but exactly, like you say, how's that going? And that's, yeah. So there are definitely, there's a lot of research to be done in that space of, well, where can we draw? Where is it valid analogical reasoning and where does that, does that stop? Where can we not draw conclusions from other areas? I got the microphone before Malta. Um, <laughs> well, Malta does get a chance to ask a question. <laughs> Thanks, Anita. That's really impressive and just great for you sitting here listening to you. Um, I was interested in your views on whether there's going to be a separate governance architecture um, and whether ideally there should be a separate governance architecture for CDR versus SRM because CDR is inherently quite local in many respects and there is an emerging debate around actions and governance on that whereas SRM, of course, is very much less local. So if you look at this, that doesn't necessarily hold true um, just because there are, uh, there are things you could do out there. That, so, for example, high-level afforestation would change the albedo of the Earth, so therefore it would also have an effect on a global scale. Um, so, yes, yes, I think, so whether I think, yes, I think that we shouldn't maybe be lumping them all together, but then the more we split it out, the more we're going to realise we've got to split it out even more, and then even more. So my thesis was really just about thinking about it as, as this new part of geoengineering, uh, sorry, of climate policy. But I think there's just going to be no way to, to tackle geoengineering as just one, one beast. It's going to be most likely... Um, issues for example ocean acidification that Ellie looks at is you can't you can't separate geoengineering from the issue of ocean acidification because once you do you're only solving half the problem so some of it will need to be looked at from there the impacts on biodiversity we looked at in the convention on biological diversity will there need to be a new treaty that sort of brings that all together I don't know these are all the debates that are out there but there, you can argue both ways. There are arguments that, yes, we should maybe putting them all together so that nobody tries to sort of forum shop and take it out um, of, of areas or, or lessen the governance in a certain area. Um, and then there are arguments that get the other way. I actually don't have an answer because it's just that complex. Last question. Thank you. Um, thank you I very much. I'll you miss out. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for your presentation. Um, the question that I have sort of brings together aspects of the last two questions in particular and the point around these technologies having that potential to um, decrease people's um, cause for decarbonisation through behaviour. The question that I have is through your process in working with these different groups, did you observe opportunities where it may go the other way, that in having these discussions in a more collaborative um, and interdisciplinary um, context that perhaps as people start to see that well, this is looking pretty extreme but it's also looking like we might have to go down this path that that might actually be used as a way to increase people's desire to change their behaviours in a way that creates a positive outcome that could be worked in collaboration with these technologies. Yeah so thanks for that question. So while um I said the moral hazard is something, so there's likeliness to lessen the incentive to decarbonise. This was a big part of the initial debate in 2009 when it was for, well, too far, I just wanted to look at my baby again. Uh, this was one part of, a big part of the debate when this came out. I started, everyone was talking about the moral hazard. And then sh ideas have shifted now and people are saying, well, actually, there's no proof to say the moral hazard would occur. I think that's probably the people that really want to do research saying, well... Tell me that it's that it, you know it's actually going to happen. There's a paper put out. I think he is by I forget his name. I think the paper is called the Tuvalu syndrome or something, and it alludes to exactly what you're saying. And it's a game theoretic paper that says, well, actually, you know, there is that that uh, that possibility that by talking about geoengineering and how drastic that would be and how you know so for example one of the impacts of stratospheric aerosols is that the sky wouldn't be blue anymore it would be a more milky white and that could have psychological problems that could create psychological problems in um, big parts of the population and you know does that scare people enough that we then would increase our pressure so that we would um, decarbonize and so there's definitely a literature out there saying well it could go either way the truth is we don't have any proof that would 
or not, but everything we've seen so far. So if you look at seatbelts, once seatbelts came in, everybody drove faster and more, you know, more um, crazily because we had seatbelts and we had airbags, so we're fine. So it, it ten, it, the history tends to suggest that we would go that way, but there's no way to prove it. And that's where this problem is of, um, uh, of we don't actually know what's gonna happen until we do it. So how much of a risk are we prepared to take? I think we should all join together and thank Anita for a fantastic <laughs> seminar. There are future talks, and this is the advertisement from yep. the... So just visit our website. These are our upcoming talks. I will point you to the 13th of Feb. We actually had Miranda from IASS in Germany who will be talking about her research on climate engineering. So if you want to hear more about climate engineering governance, she'll be speaking uh, next week. Um, and any of these, please register on our website. And if you can't make it, watch it online. Thank you very much. Thank you.